welcome back to the um, welcome back to um, the Quagmire. In today's episode, um, for the first time, we're actually going to interview, cross-examine one of our hosts' ideas. Um, so our host Harry, he wrote um, a very interesting um, <clears throat> article for a philosophy newsletter in January. So on the topic of consciousness. So um, yeah, um, Harry, give a summary for what this um, what this article talks about, basically. Okay, so uh, the article is called Demonstrating the Truth of a Consciousness Only Ontology. And in it, I uh, try to argue that consciousness is the only thing that exists mm -hmm. um, based on consciousness as non-objectivity. So um, consciousness is purely subjective and it has no fixed form. Mm -hmm. and so based on that premise, I make a number of arguments. Um, the main one being that there's nothing other than consciousness because if there was something other than consciousness, like outside consciousness, mm -hmm. something, then consciousness also would have to be a thing to not be that other thing. So if consciousness had an outside, that would be like a property of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And to have a property, to have some kind of fixed property, consciousness would have to have some kind of fixed objective form. Mm -hmm. But consciousness doesn't have any objective form. It's totally formless, pure subjective awareness when it doesn't have an outside. So um, that would be the main argument. And then like some derivative arguments would be that consciousness has no cause because consciousness can't have a beginning or an end because if consciousness had a beginning or an end, it would have to have some kind of fixed objective form. That would have to be something that preceded it, something that followed it. In order for something to cause consciousness, there would have to be something other than consciousness. And then I conclude the essay by arguing that like there's a, there's a famous question, like why is there something rather than nothing? And I say that there's neither something or nothing because there's just no thing. There's just consciousness, which isn't either something or nothing. It's not a fixed thing. Neither is it nothing. It's just a kind of formless, dimensionless, pure knowing presence kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. um, I know I feel um, what you're saying about courses and stuff. Um, your like um, idea of consciousness, it kind of. Um, it kind of bypasses a lot of, um, you know, the, like, you know how Aquinas says we need, like, a first course, like, the universe needs a first course, and that must be a god. In a way, um, would you say this view of consciousness kind of bypasses this need for a quote-unquote first course or an unmoved mover? Sure, because, like, the chain of causality relies on there being, like, things, so God would be the first thing, and then he causes another thing, and then he causes mm -hmm. another thing, because, like, in Western philosophy, like, the world is, like, made out of things, because, mm -hmm. like, the world's built by God, so to speak, and yeah. God is, like, a carpenter, like, Jesus Christ is a carpenter, mm -hmm. and, like, a carpenter, when, when a human being assembles things, he assembles things out of parts, so, like, in Western philosophy, you have this idea that the world is, like, a construct made out of parts. So you have God, who's the first thing, causes another thing in this huge chain of causation. But I'm just saying that there's only consciousness. So there's no first cause, second cause, third cause. There's just consciousness by itself, which is just kind of like this dimensionless, um, f like, field of pure knowing. You know, so there's... See, sorry? No, no, go on. So there's just God. So it's, it's not that God's the first cause. God doesn't bring the world into existence. There's just God, infinite consciousness, God's infinite mind kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe we should kind of, uh, first of all, you should define um, what you mean by consciousness or mm -hmm. define um, you, what definition of consciousness that you're using. Yeah, in the essay I reference Rupert Spira and he says that consciousness is that in which all experience appears, that with which all experience is known and that out of which all experience is made. So any experience that you have appears in a kind of space. So like your experience, like when you are five years old, your experience now, your experience in when you're you know old and stuff, or your experience of being born, your experience of dying, all your experience arises in a certain kind of space. And that space, nothing, so to speak, it's a space. It's not really spatial, but it's like a, like a field, so to speak. And that field itself is, is consciousness. And whatever temporary form, temporary experience kind of flows through that consciousness, that field of consciousness is always the same kind of formless, dimensionless presence. So 
like, and, and the reason why consciousness can contain any form, you know, the, the experience of a five-year-old girl, the experience of Donald Trump, the experience of a cloud or whatever, it's because consciousness itself has no inherent form. It's a totally formless void, kind of. So, I mean, some people's, some people's definition of consciousness would be it's, it's what it is to be like something. So if there is, you know, to be like something, like if there is something existing, which it is to be like, so we don't have that for rocks, for example, we do have that for animals. Um, and there's like a debate that, you know, that some things are not conscious, but for you, there is what it is like to be a cloud in that. No, it, it's not that, um, it's not that like things have consciousness. So there's like this big presumption in, in particularly uh, that like bodies are conscious. So like that like human beings are conscious, cats are conscious and like rocks aren't conscious. But what I'm saying is there's just consciousness. There's just this formless, dimensionless, pure knowing and all possible experiences arise in that. So what it's like to be a, a, a girl or whatever, or what it's like to be a rock, are experiences arising in consciousness. Consciousness doesn't arise in any particular body. Kind of thing. Does that answer the question? Okay, so yep. What you're saying is um, essentially that um, I mean, everything is consciousness, everything is part of consciousness, um, but like bodies such as like, you know, humans, um, animals, they can't have the ability to um, interpret that consciousness, whether that well as um, a rock cannot interpret it. Or... No, there's no such thing as, as rocks or human bodies or anything like that. There's just consciousness itself. Because if you look at your experience now, like all you know of a world or a body or a or your hands or the, the computer in front of you is an appearance in, in this kind of dimensionless field of consciousness. So like if you're asking like what's real. You yeah. can't verify the reality of the planet Earth or your own body or whatever. You can only verify the existence of consciousness because that's the only thing, so to speak, that you ever actually come into contact with. You know, so it's not that the body interacts with consciousness or the body uh, does this. The body's in kind of like an appearance in consciousness. So I'm, I'm not like denying the body. Obviously, there's a reason why experience is formulated in a certain way. Like, it's not that like, I'm denying the existence of like appearances because obviously there's the appearance of the body, but I'd suggest that the body is like the external image of the, your kind of finite mind. So like, obviously your experience is different from mine right now because you're experiencing your bedroom, I'm experiencing my bedroom. But like, so obviously there are two kind of finite minds and I'd say that the body is like the external image of that process of localization of a finite mind in infinite consciousness kind of thing. So there's no really existent physical body. The body is like the external image of kind of like a mental process. So for you, the, the, the real world is purely made up of um, perceptions and sensations. Yeah, the real world is, is infinite consciousness, yeah. But when you say infinite consciousness, I mean, have you experienced infinite consciousness yourself? Well, infinite consciousness is, is just the field of consciousness in which all experiences arise. So, but have you experienced consciousness. infinite consciousness? Well, there's only infinite consciousness. If, if you look at... But if know, all we know is what we experience within consciousness, then how can you have knowledge of something that you've never experienced? I don't know what you mean that I've never experienced it because all experiences are made of, of only of consciousness itself. Like if you look at any experience, like the experience of your hand, all you know of that object is the knowing of it. You know what I mean? The, the, it's like a TV screen and an image. Like you don't find the Im you can't scrape the image off the screen. Like all that's there. If you look at a screen and you see a tree, like that's not really a tree there. It's just the screen. So if you look at your hand, there's not really a hand there. There's just the, the screen, so to speak, of consciousness, you know? So all you ever experience is consciousness, whatever particular form it takes. Like you say, like, can I, can I experience infinite consciousness? But what I'm saying in the, in the article is consciousness, you can't experience consciousness because it has no form. Like all forms are kind of finite experiences. So you can experience a mountain or a tree or blah, blah, blah. You can't, so to speak, 
experiencing that consciousness as a particular object because it has no objective form or forms appear within. Sure, sure. But you make the intellectual leap to um, from all we can all we can know is our own experience within consciousness. You make that intellectual leap to uh, consciousness being infinite. When I say infinite, I don't mean like big, like infinitely extended. I just mean like non -fin non finite, like non definite, like dimensionless. Like it has no kind of. It's not like an infinite space because. It's just like this dimension. It has no qualities. It's infinite, like it's it's indefinite, in in effable kind of in. Um, it has no qualities, like no fixed qualities. And, and I mean, that's uh, yeah, but it's it's kind of. Do you do you not think that it is sort of that you are, kind of you are positing a theory, that you're saying that all we ever know is our experience within consciousness, but then you make that intellectual leap to all there is is consciousness that in consciousness is infinite but it's very it's very um you only know your own experience you only have your own finite experiences you've never had you know you've never been into the consciousness of another person you've never experienced that you've never experienced infinity yourself so to say that you can that your theory this is the kind of the end goal that consciousness is infinite and everything it's, it's it's an intellectual leap for me to go from from only you can only know what's in your experience which is you experience everything within consciousness there is nothing else to go from that to infinite consciousness that there is only consciousness but how would you possibly experience anything other than consciousness? Because I mean, like, if if like our technology advanced like a, like a billion years into the future, you know how like uh, science is like trying to make us like omniscient and omnipotent kind of thing. Like, imagine if we progress for like a billion years and like we had like a brain the size of Jupiter and like all human minds merged into one and we became like a, some kind of psychedelic god at the end of time, like you know, completely omnipotent. You know, even if we were that how would we experience anything outside of consciousness? Like by definition, even if we built like a giant machine the size of a universe to try and bust through to the things in themselves and we kind of like switched this machine on and there was a giant flash of lightning and a rift opened up and, and we emerged into the land of things in themselves and we, oh yeah, we've made it. And we pick up one of the things in themselves and hold on, it's just an appearance in consciousness. Like how do you get outside of consciousness? Like, so it's not like, you know, saying there could be something outside of consciousness, it doesn't really, I mean, first of all, you can never get there, you know, because by definition, you can never experience something outside of consciousness, because it's like I said, you know, like, how would you bust through into things in themselves? Like, you know, what kind, you know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. And also, second of all, like with the argument that I make in the paper, like, there can't be anything other than consciousness because if there was something outside of consciousness, consciousness would have to have an outside, which would mean that consciousness would have to be some kind of thing. It would have some kind of fixed property kind of thing. You know, like there can be an outside of a ball. There can be an outside of planet Earth because these things have kind of fixed observable properties, you know, but, but consciousness is completely formless. It has no, you, you know, when I say like consciousness is formless, I'm not just like talking theory and stuff like if you look at consciousness or you know look at consciousness uh so to speak it has no for it has you can't see consciousness like as an object it's completely void you know it's even but at the same time you can't see you one of your examples that you use is sight so that you can't see sight it's a perception um you only have what you see and then the processes in your brain but that doesn't mean that everything is made of sight you know that all there is is sight you know what I mean? Like it's kind of, I just feel like it's making, it, it is making a leap towards, it, it's very human centric. It's very um, anthro, anthrocentric, is that the word? Um, to say that this is what you experience, therefore that, that must be all there is. I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's human centric because I'm, I don't think that consciousness has got anything to do with human beings. You know, I think that con human, human experiences an experience in consciousness. I'm not sure that it's it's not human consciousness or human experience. Uh, but it's you are basing this 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 thesis on what you experience and yeah. what you've intellectualized from that experience. 
that you believe that there is nothing other than consciousness, um, that you there's nothing other than your experience within consciousness. There is no physical uh, world, there is no matter, there is no you know physicality at all. There is no other matter or what do you call it? No other substance. Well, let's, put, let's put it like this, you know, like, um, uh, what do you call him, the, the atheist guy? Uh, Richard Dawkins? Yeah, Richard Dawkins. You know, like how he talks about God, where he says to, like, the Christian, he says to a Christian, like, there are, like, there are two reasons for saying that something's true, you know, or that something exists. Like, reason number one would be that you experience it directly. And reason number two would be that you have to infer its existence to, to like, to explain um, something. Yeah, so if like a bullet came whizzing through this room, it would be natural for me to assume, oh, there's a gun on the other side of the wall, you know, like that because the bullet hole would be evidence and it would be logical for me to assume that. So like if we apply that to physical matter or the world outside of consciousness, one, we never experience it directly. We have no direct experience of the world outside of consciousness. Not only that, but we could never, literally could never experience anything outside of consciousness by definition. And number two, we don't need to infer the existence of physical matter for any reason at all, because it's perfectly consistent with science and it's perfectly consistent with logic to have a consciousness only ontology. So in the interest of parsimony, just we, we can just abandon the, the hypothesis of physical matter, just like Dawkins abandons the hypothesis of a Christian God. It's, it's just not necessary. Um, your view of consciousness um, is non-dualistic, is it not? It's, it's monist, would you say? Yeah, I suppose like there's only uh, one thing. I mean, you could say there's only one thing. I mean, I, I prefer to say it's non-dual because to say that it's there's one thing, like consciousness isn't really a thing. But yeah, you could say that it's monist, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, I mean, <clears throat> I don't feel agreement with me here, but um, I know I've seen some, there has been some evidence within the universe that there is maybe a form of dualism. So the existence of matter and let's say dark matter and stuff maybe um, looking at, you know, those two concepts and stuff, you can see that maybe there is sort of like, you know, a dualism within the universe rather than a non-duality because, you know, this dark matter has been observed and it's clearly separate from, you know, matter and stuff. Like, it's clearly separate from, like, us. So how would your theory, like, you know, reconcile with the existence of dark matter? Well... Even if you found dark matter and you had a handful of it, so to speak, that would be an experience in consciousness. Yeah, like, like there's no, you know, it's not inconsistent, like science isn't inconsistent with my theory because like anything that you experience, like the entire world that you experience, including the dark matter and antimatter and particles and all, it's all an experience in consciousness. And there's, there's like results in quant uh, quantum mechanics that verify that. I mean, I'm not an expert in quantum mechanics, but from what I've read, like uh, talks about like, there's no, I mean, really, I shouldn't get into quantum mechanics, but, but there's some evidence, you know, that there's that there's no physical world coming out of quantum mechanics. Okay. You just have to take my word. I mean, I'm not. Sure. I can't go <laughs> <laughs> just to drop that there. Like, yeah, you just have to take my word. <laughs> All right, I'll take that back. I shouldn't say it if I can't. If I can't back it up. We'll try and edit that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I was just going to say, is there, I was going to ask, is there, is there somewhere that you're, that this thesis stems from? Is there, where did you find it? Where did you come across it originally? Um, is it like anything else in, that we have in history? Um, well, yeah, it's, uh, there's this guy called Rupert Spira, who I like, who's like a Western um, advocate of like, uh, uh, um, Advaita Vedanta philosophy from India. Like, uh, so like a lot of um, Eastern philosophy comes from that basis and like Western non-duality tries to strip away all the kind of religious um, paraphernalia and stuff and get to like the root um, truth of like a lot of these Eastern traditions, which I think is non-duality, you know, so he talks about a lot. There's a philosopher called Bernardo Castro, who um, mm -hmm. is like an idealist philosopher, and he says pretty much the same thing, that there's only consciousness and um, the world in itself is consists of mental states. Uh, also, the metaphysics of Schopenhauer. Um, I've just been reading a book about him, and I think that he, with his theory of will and, will and representation, so he says that um, what there is really, like the thing in, it, thing in itself, reality itself, is the will, which is like 
uh, mental states. And then there's will, which is like, um, you know, feelings like, um, emo like deep emotions. And then there's representation, which is the world of appearances. And he says like the will has no ground, you know, so that there's certain similarities with, um, with Schopenhauer. Um, I have a question about your theory. So um, let's say we have, um, you know, a room maybe, a room outside of experience, a hypothetical room that literally no single, no, no one has experienced. Like, let's say, um, I don't know, let's call it the non-experience room. That's just like a room with like, you know, many different items. Let's say someone lights a fire in that room and there is no single experience of that room. Um, so it starts out as normal, but then you kind of open up that room a few hours later and it's all in flames. Um, what caused that without any, any like, you know, mind to experience it or any consciousness to experience it? What caused um, that? Well, I think that in order for it to be a room, you would have to experience it. But in the absence of experience, I don't think that it would be a room. I think that it would just be, no. I think like, like I'd say that like consciousness exists like um, as a kind of like infinite potentiality and your mind kind of like collapses that potentiality into, into certain fin finite mm -hmm. possibilities kind of so to speak. So I don't think that, that, that if you weren't experienced in the room, I don't think that there would be a room there. It would just be like, because in order for there to be a room, you, have, you would have to experience it as such. So like the age old question of if a, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear, hear it, does it, does it really happen? Basically, Does yeah. it make a sound? Mm -hmm. well, I would say that so, it doesn't happen even if you do experience it. Because really? there's just, there's just consciousness, you know, it's, there's no, there's no tree, there's no forest. It's all just, there's consciousness and then there's your mind, which is kind of like a, a snapshot of, of infinity, you know, so th there's not really a tree there which falls, I'd say. Because there is, I mean, it is, it is like, what do you, what's the word? It is kind of, um, there's something about your theory that kind of sways me because everything that I sort of read, there is always a question of what is, what is the thing in itself? What is behind what we perceive, you know? And, and some philosophers have, um, God, I can't think of words today, have hypothesized that, you know, we don't see the world as it is. We create narratives out of, you know, we look for patterns. It's just, the way that we're kind of trained and um, the way we've evolved. We've evolved to look for things that, that sort of are for our survival and we need to see the world in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that when you, you look at something and process, I think actually Paul was talking about this in metaphysics about descriptive and revisionary metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So you see that, you know, a car's coming, you hear the sound, you see the color, you know, these are the things that you see first. And then I don't know, other stuff happens as well <laughs> for you to process it. But you you make those narratives in your in your experience. You you sort of put it together that it's a car, you know. Or this the the example of that. Um, I think it was a TED talk, and this guy plays a distorted recording, and it's like, oh, and he says, then I said I would like a sandwich, and then you listen to it again, and you can hear. I don't like a sandwich, but before you, you you knew what was being said, it didn't sound like words to you at all. It was just distortion. But once someone told you these are the words that are being said, your brain maps it and hears it perfectly, you know, a little bit distorted, but perfectly. So the, these kinds of things, you know, they are kind of making me think, okay, well, yeah, how, how is the world if we're not seeing it as we we perceive it, as as our brains are, are, um, are processing it? how is the world in itself, you know? And when you come along with your conscious only, consciousness only ontology, it really does make me, make me question what is the real world, you know? Mm. That was I mean, just you... a long little monologue there, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Carry on. No, oh, um, I was just gonna say like, before you said um, something like, you can never experience infinite consciousness. You know, like, but if, like by definition, like the mind itself is, is always limited, you know, mm -hmm. like in order to have like an experience, that experience is always limited. So you can't have like an infinite mind because 
your your mind is always kind of like a infinity condensed into one particular possibility you know so like yeah infinite consciousness in itself would be kind of like deep sleep where there's there's just pure consciousness without experience and then when you when you wake up your mind kind of collapses or contracts into into one particular finite possibility kind of thing so it wouldn't be possible sorry I, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, you do posit all these little kind of, is this, is this your sort of, is this your take on, on other things that you've read? That when you say about like, you know, something like that, when you talk about when you're sleeping, that's infinite consciousness. And then when you wake, you know, you kind of, you, you zoom back into it to a finite mind. I mean, or is this coming from someone else's theory? You don't zoom into a finite mind. There's all, it's always just infinite consciousness. It's not like in deep sleep, there's infinite consciousness. Like it's always infinite consciousness. It's more just that the mind is kind of like you're always in deep sleep. Yeah, it contracts, so it doesn't really contract objectively, but it's like, um, you know, you could say it refracts or it contracts, but you're always kind of in deep sleep. There's always just infinite consciousness, but the mind is kind of like a, a, a localization with that. It's like when you watch a movie, you're always seeing the same screen, but sometimes the screen's blank and sometimes it has a movie on it, but it's always the same screen kind of thing. But this, the screen, you know the screen can display what a, an infinite potential of images you know so the screen it doesn't really contract into the image or or refract into the image it's more like um i mean the reason why an image can appear on it at all i mean the, it, it, it's subtle really because the, the image never really appears because you can never say oh an image has appeared and and, and kind of grab the image there, there never, there's never really anything there. It's always just the screen with its influence. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the analogy of the screen, I have to say, is quite, is because it's a thing that you're talking about and you can think about things outside of the screen other than the screen. I don't think it's a great analogy for, for, your, for your kind of hypothesis or thesis or whatever. But I mean, to go back to that infinite consciousness, I mean, what I was asking, I mean, talking about like you're saying that consciousness is infinite, but you can't experience it because your your mind is finite, is a bit like saying, you know, God is there, but you won't see it because you don't have, you know, the right tools or, you know, it's kind of positing that thing that's beyond reach that nobody can get, that, that's quite sort of similar to to a kind of a theism or you know that's saying that it's there but we can't experience it because we're limited i think that's a con like a bit of confusion about language because when i say infinite maybe i shouldn't say infinite maybe i should say um formless you know i, I don't mean like there's some kind of infinite consciousness like no it, it's infinite in the fact that it is all there is i mean no one can really sort of i don't think anybody can really grasp infinite um, infinity as a, as, a, as a concept except maybe mathematicians that throw it around but when you say that the consciousness you are telling us that consciousness is infinite and I'm asking how do you know that because I think that you're making a leap from your finite consciousness you're in intellectualizing something and saying it is infinite um, but how do you know that if we can't experience or, like, or even conceive of it like look at so Take in your experience now, we'll do like a thought experiment, right? So like just experience as you're experiencing now. Now, like everything that you experience is finite. Yeah, so like mm -hmm. the computer in front of you, it's all like a fixed and finite forms, right? So, but all of your finite experience appears in a, in a kind of space of consciousness, a field mm -hmm. of consciousness. So like, forget about what you're experiencing at the minute. And so like, like imagine that like, um, turn your attention instead of from your objective experience towards the consciousness that's experiencing it. Now, there, there are limits to your experience. Is there a limit to that which is experiencing your experience? I mean, hypothetically, um, couldn't you want a convoluted that, question? <laughs> couldn't you want that there is stuff that couldn't be experienced, but still could exist? No, well, I, I would say that even if you experience something that doesn't exist, it's just all that's real is just consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, like, you don't think. Sorry, that's... could you re rephrase that question that you asked just before about the um, experience that I'm experiencing and so the like limits? All, all of your experience that, that, that you're having now and that you've ever had is, is limited, yeah, and finite. Mm -hmm. So, like, your experience now 
is like obviously you're not experiencing what's going on in China or what, mm-hmm. what it's like on the moon or whatever. Like you're you're having a certain finite experience. Your thoughts and feelings and perceptions are all limited, but mm-hmm. all of your limited thoughts and feelings and perceptions and experiences appear in a kind of space of pure knowing a knowing space kind of mm-hmm. it's not really it's like a space but there's no extension it's a space or a field so it's, i'm doing like air quotes it's it's like this space of consciousness so to speak mm-hmm. so there's limits to what you experience but are there any limits in that which is the experiencing in the field in in which the experience is appearing because that's what I mean by consciousness being infinite. But then, but then, I mean, I, yeah, I kind of, I get what you're talking about, but um, it just makes me think like, you know, when they talk about the consciousness in another person, so, it, you know, sort of kind of leaving aside, I know you're like, there is no separate consciousnesses, there is only one consciousness. But when philosophers talk about how do we know that the other exists and you can't experience their consciousness, you can only experience your own consciousness. So you can only experience your own consciousness, Harry. No, but what other consciousness? I don't know what you mean, like another consciousness, because all of my, it's like, for instance, all of your experiences that you have throughout your life, like, for instance, when you're a five-year-old girl and when you are 20 and when you, all that, all your experiences that you've ever had and all your experiences that you will have in the future all appear in the same consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, why is it a leap to say that all parallel mi- all of all parallel minds appear in the same consciousness as well? If all subsequent minds appear in the same consciousness, why not all parallel minds? Like you can't experience right now what it's like to be a five-year-old girl, but you but you would admit that your, those experiences appeared in your. Co- my my experiences my experiences that's all I have experience of is my own experience that's all I'll ever have is my own experience through consciousness so you're making a leap to say that it's all one that we all are part of the same consciousness and I think it's a leap I mean it's it's sort of you know it's it's what's the principle of um I think you asked the question about it in class the principle of the, you know, the the simplest explanation, the Absolutely. Occam's razor. Say again. Occam's razor. Yeah, Occam's razor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Occam's razor. Yeah, and for me, it doesn't follow that that sort of rule, you know, that principle. There's there's lots of things that have to be explained, and 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 I know you would probably say that about physicalism, um, or you know, a sort of. A, a different theory you would maybe say that as well but for me in my mind there seems to be a lot of explanation needed and and, and a few like a, a, f- a bit of a Descartes leap to go from this to this you know I don't see how you can how you can justify that leap well it requires a lot of explanation just because it's counterintuitive to our ordinary expectations and stuff but, but I mean, then I'm... why would why would a theory that's counterintuitive be the right theory well it's just counterintuitive because we've been raised in the opposite way to believe opposite things you know no one tells you about no one gave you this theory when you were growing up in school and stuff it was all physical it's like you're, you're conditioned to be a physicalist kind of thing but I, I make an argument in the in the paper about you know saying you're saying like you can only experience your own consciousness and stuff like in order for that to be two consciousnesses consciousness would have to have some kind of fixed form you know it would have to be some kind of thing with a fixed thing like nature for there to be two things one consciousness and two consciousnesses there would have to be a border or a boundary or a difference between my consciousness and your consciousness but it's like i was saying before there's a there's a difference between like our experiences because our experiences are finite but the consciousness in which those experiences are are appearing you can't say oh it's mine and then you have another one because there would have to be some kind of nature some kind of fixed nature to the field or the consciousness in which all experience appears and that field is totally dimensionless and has no fixed identity or form. But I mean, at the same time, it could be that we're sort of trying to judge consciousness in, in terms of, of the, things that the, the things that we know, which is that when you talk about borders or, or dimensionless or whatever, having borders, not having borders, we can only conceive of things in that way. That's why we think of things of objects as having borders, of having, you know, um, qualities and 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 things and properties. That's that's only like that's what I was talking kind of talking about before when when it says that we are quite limited in the way that we perceive the world and the way that we can perceive the world. That 
maybe we are limited in the way that we can perceive consciousness, you know, in the same way that you kind of have made the leap that it must be all. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to make that leap, even after all of your explanations and reading about it. And, you know, the, the kind of, there are other philosophers that sort of allude to it and allude to there only being one substance or, or, or something like this. But just that, that maybe there isn't, it is, just isn't possible for us to, to understand or perceive or conceive of what consciousness might be and what it's made of, or, you know, and that we have to posit things that we kind of, in ways that we can understand or, or um, intellectualize. I mean, like I watched this film recently called Arrival. Have you seen that before? Where it's like um, Amy Adams is trying to translate this alien language. Like these aliens come down and they're trying to communicate and she has to translate the language. And it turns out that the aliens um, experience their entire lives all at once. So they oh, experience the past and the future all at the same time. Like Dr. Right. Manhattan out of uh, Watchmen. And so they're experiencing all their experiences simultaneously. But even, even so like when you're saying like, oh, I don't know, like there might be other minds and other ways of interpreting. Even if you had that, where you were experiencing all of your experiences simultaneously, even if all of humanity merged together and had and, and had that where we're having all possible human experiences or whatever, like I don't, just can't, like even if you're experiencing all your experiences simultaneously, it would be in consciousness. Where would that, where would that experience appear of, of your entire life all at once? It would appear in consciousness, you know, like the, I'm just, I, I can't, like it feels like a leap to me, like what you're doing, where you say, oh, well, maybe there's, you know, we don't know this and there might be something other than consciousness. But I just don't see any reason to, like, even if I was literally God and I was omniscient, where would my omniscient experience appear? It would appear in consciousness, you know? I just don't see any reason to suggest. Well, the thing is, though, that that's where I think you're making a leap, because if rocks are not conscious, and I know you're saying that everything is consciousness, but if rocks are not conscious, the humans and animals, um, are the ones that experience consciousness as we know it, as we have the common definition for consciousness of what it is like to be something that, you know, you're kind of, you're looking at it from that point of view only that I have these experiences, therefore this must be the substance and, and the nature of the universe. It's very, I do find it to be quite grandiose and sort of, like I said, human or anthropocentric in that it's kind of, this is how I experience the world, therefore this must be the answer to the universe. And it, it's it, that that's why I, I feel that there is that leap and I prefer to stay on the side of physicalism and things that can be explained by evolution and random um, experiences, random, um, random things happening, cause and effect or whatever, you know, I don't know. I just I, I go over more to, to that side and that I, I think I will always fight against your against your hypothesis, your, your thesis of a non-dualism. I don't know if that's really the right categorization for it, but anyway. That, um, as Paul said, do you have any, like, you know, you have arguments for, like, you know, um, consciousness, but do you have any arguments that, like, undoubtedly would feel physicalism or not? Like, do you have any, like, arguments? You know, that what you saying? I guess I'd refer back to uh, I'd refer back to what I said, like the Richard Dawkins thing, where it's like that. I just don't see any reason to suggest that there, there is physicalism. I don't see why. Like what I'm saying isn't anti-scientific, or it's completely in line with science. Science, and you mm -hmm. know, you can have a science based on a consciousness-only ontology, where um, where instead of matter, you just have like mind processes. It's mm -hmm. it's not. I'm not arguing against scientific evidence and stuff. Like I don't. I just don't see any reason to posit. A substance that nobody has ever experienced you know that this mm -hmm. physical matter that we don't need to posit nobody's ever experienced it like why are we keeping it around you know like like god you know died because you know people kind of thought well hold on a minute i, I never experienced god and there's no reason to suggest that he exists so so he died you know and i think that the same thing will happen to, to physical matter i don't see any reason i think it's an anachronism really so you're saying we don't experience yeah, you're. So you're saying we basically don't experience any. How do you know that it isn't physical matter that we're experiencing? Because, because for instance, when you're in a dream, you have experiences that that aren't that don't have some kind of corresponding physical, external mm -hmm. reality causing them. 
you know, like you can have like, like for instance, hallucinations, you can have, you know, mental uh, appearances that don't have any kind of external cause, you know, but like all I'm saying is that the entire entirety of your experience is that there's no, I don't see any reason to say that, oh, there's something outside of the mind, you know, because mm. all you have, all you experience is consciousness is the mind, the inside of the mind, you know, ne you never leave the mind and experience, oh, look, there's a physical object all you experience are appearances in the mind, you know? So I don't see why we're making a, a jump and saying, oh yes, there's this outside of the mind existing in some hypothetical physical realm impinging on my mind. Why, why posit that? It, it's not necessary, just stick with the mind itself, you know? And instead of saying, oh, in reality, there's physical matter and then my mind is derivative of that. Well, actually all of our experience is mental. So all we would just, you know, instead of just put the mind as reality instead of physical matter but i think that it makes far more sense you know okay. can i ask you then um maybe i think we have to wrap up soon but can i ask you then what do you think the meaning of life is then to find happiness mm -hmm. and why because like by definition when you're happy you don't want anything else you know like when you if you like for instance like when you like pursue uh, a career or a partner or whatever you're not really pursuing the thing itself. You're pursuing the happiness that you think you're going to derive from it. So I think that if you're perfectly contented and happy, uh, you wouldn't want anything else, you know? And I think that like also that ties in with the consciousness only thing, because if what, what I'm saying is that you're not a human being, the human being, the human body and the all the human experience is an appearance in consciousness. Your nature is this conscious field, you know, like, like it's non-duality, there's just consciousness, you know, and that's what you are. You are this field of consciousness in which all experiences are arising. So like, even when you, even if there was like a frog and like there was just frog experiences, all those experiences arise in you, like you are the one. I, actually, I should have made that clear. Like you are infinite consciousness. I'm not saying like there's infinite consciousness and then you are like a little human being inside of that. All experience arises in you. You are this dimensionless presence of you know, you are God, so to speak, you know, you are the dimensionless presence of infinite consciousness itself and all possible experiences arise in you, which means there's no such thing as death. You know, you are this kind of formless dimensionless void, which in which all experiences arise. So would you say that kind of um, stop, <clears throat> would you say um, the idea of like just everything being infinite, con like infinite consciousness, they're not being separate consciousnesses, would you say that kind of um, makes it so that the ego isn't really a thing or the ego doesn't really have <clears throat> or that the ego is basically meaningless well i'd say that the ego is just the identification that we have with the body you know so like in in our culture we're trained to think that oh i am the body so like i am this arm and i'm not this desk i am this brain this body and i'm not that building across the street but what i'm saying is that there's just infinite consciousness and all experiences or appearances in that infinite consciousness so like you're not any more the body than you are the building. You're, you are this formless presence in which all experiences arise. So the ego is just kind of like, uh, the, the ego that says, oh, I am the body is, is mistaken in my opinion. So would you, so would you say that, um, that because um, this quote unquote ego that we have an idea of, because um, that is the common cause of most of our dispel unhappiness, would you say this idea of consciousness can be used to um, kind of combat this despair and kind of lead to pure happiness? Yeah, of course, because it's not, you're not a human, you're not involved in, you know, human life appears in you, you don't appear, like the world appears as an experience in you, you don't appear in the world. So your, mm -hmm. your being is not at stake, you know, like in the ordinary way of thinking, like my being is fundamentally at stake in the world so that if someone kills me, I'm dead and I'm, I'm gone. Well, what I'm saying is that all experience appears in me. I am the dimensionless presence of consciousness. So even if this body is destroyed, I'm not destroyed. It's just like a dream, you know, like when you die in a dream that, you know, you don't die because the dream appears in you. You don't appear in the dream. You know what I mean? So yeah, they, of course it's happiness because you're not at stake. It's like when you have a lucid dream and you wake up in the dream and you and suddenly you're filled with happiness, you know, and you think, oh, this is a lucid dream. That's fantastic. Why are you happy? Because you realize that it doesn't matter what happens, because whatever happens, 
it's just it, it's it's appearing in you. You're not at stake. Your your being isn't at stake. You can't be hurt, kind of thing. Even if you are attacked and tortured in the dream, it, you're not touched by it because it's all an appearance in you, kind of thing. You're not you're not trapped in it. You know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, like in in this theory. I mean, so if, if there is a theory of physicalism and, you know, matter and substance, there is um, a, a posit of the, the Big Bang. And also, um, I think, is it Roger Penrose talks about this? Um, is it the kind of cyclical nature that he thinks that perhaps before the Big Bang, there was another thing that's going to happen to the universe now that it will all kind of go towards the, you know, get consumed by black holes. And then there will be another Big Bang in, you know, millions and trillions and billions and gazillions of years. So with, with kind of physicalism and, and physics and, and, and matter, there is kind of these explanations coming forth about the beginning of the universe or, you know, a beginning of our universe or our, our you know, what we kind of know as, as, a, as a physical universe that's evolved on a planet, that these things happened over these millions of years. So does your, does your hypothesis have any kind of beginning, any evolution, any end, any... Um, any point, any meaning, any sort of, is there a reason for, for consciousness? There's no reason for consciousness because consciousness is reality itself. I, I wouldn't, I'm not necessarily denying evolution, but what I would say is that like, your mind is always a limited um, interpretate, yeah. like consciousness is like a, a infinite and eternal and your mind collapses that infinity and eternity. So like, what we see as like time and space is like time is like infinite consciousness refracted or contracted by the finite mind. Space is the infinite consciousness seen through the prism of the finite mind kind of thing. So what we see as evolution, it's not really um, a process that takes like a billion years or whatever. We just see it that way through the contracted finite mind, so to speak. In reality, it, it, th- there's no such thing as really exist in time or really exist in space. It just appears that way viewed through the limitation of the human mind. In reality, that's just infinity. And, and, and our mind collapses that infinity and sees that infinity as a world of time and space kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm. Part say, sorry. I'll say, um, how would you recognize, um, so it's kind of like, um, to use like um, a Marvel analogy there, it's kind of like, um, Cyclops' eye beams, they kind of focus, um, they kind of focus the red lasers that come out of his eyes in a way. So it's kind of like um, narrowing something down so it can actually be applied to our experience so we can actually interact with it. Is it kind of like that? What do you mean? Uh, like a laser? Uh, like a laser where you refract it into a, into a concentrated beam, mm-hmm. like refracting light yeah. through a, a magnifying mm-hmm. glass. Yeah, I mean, basically. I, I, I suppose you could say that, yeah, like the, 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 there's an infinite source, which mm-hmm. is consciousness, and, and your mind is the collapse of that source into a kind of finite form, you know? Like mm-hmm. the screen, like the image on the screen is a collapse of the infinite potential of the screen into a particular image, you know? Like, I mean, I guess you could use that metaphor, yeah. How's that? Yeah, I was about to say as well. Uh, um, I was about to say as well. There's um, you know, this idea of the self and stuff is very materialistic, and this kind of like um, goes away, like um, goes away from the self. Um, how would you say that feeds into like you know political philosophy? Because a lot of modern Western capitalist ideas are fundamentally based around the self, um, individualism and stuff. So. How would you say this idea of consciousness um, kind of detracts from that way of thinking? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. It, it means that uh, it's, it has good political implications because what it means is that we are all literally the same mm-hmm. self. You know, it's, it's not that we're a brotherhood or we're a community or we're a collection of human beings. We are literally the same self, like mm-hmm. the one who is experiencing your experience and the one who is experiencing my experience is the same one, infinite consciousness, you know, yeah. like it's not it's not that we're pal, you, you, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's all the same self. So, so when you harm someone else, you're not really harming another, 
you're harming yourself because there's just you infinite consciousness you know there's no other there's no other being or other self or whatever that you are the one who is having all experience you know um i talked about like you know what it kind of rejects politically but what would it implicate politically like what kind of ideology do you think this metaphysical worldview could you know really imply uh, i'm not sure about like particular philosophical systems i think that it would I mean, I'm not sure. I think that it, like what, uh, what I said, it just it, it engenders, you know, goodwill because, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to mistreat someone or be cruel to someone when you when you know that really they're the same self as you are. You know, it's it's like you don't like hurt yourself on purpose. You know, like you 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 love yourself and yourself is the reality. You know, the universe. You know, it's it's not limited. And do you have like a sort of explanation for people who, um, you know, that sort of go against this, you know, if you talk about that we are all one and we are all the same self. So there are people that, that kind of go against that or feel, feel compelled to go against that or for whatever reason. Um, and, and, and those reasons, like, could you sort of, explain that with your theory of consciousness that there are people that go against their own interests so to so to speak i mean i'm not uh like like there, there are there are separate people there are, like there are separate obviously that like all our minds are, are are different like you know like our minds are not the same but but the consciousness in which those minds appear is the same consciousness so i'm not like saying that we all need to you know like uh Night of the Living Dead or whatever, Children of the Corn or whatever, where we all become like wearing white tunics and stuff and all become this, like obviously you can still have individuality and stuff, but it, it mm -hmm. just means that the the consciousness in which the mind appears is the, is the same consciousness. But how can you then tap into this kind of, um, this hypothesis to gain that um, that political advantage, that, that, that politically that sort of that advantage of, of how we live together because we are all one, how do you kind of tap into that? Because like, like I said, I mean, I'm having trouble, you know, sort of like your theory doesn't sit intuitively sort of well with me. There are certain aspects of it that I, that I like. Um, but how do, you, how do you see that if your theory could be used for a positive um, society, then, then how? How can we tap into that and how, like... You know, I know you said there are a few philosophers that have said similar things to you and, and Rupert Spira, and um, it's a Hindu, one of the Hindu philosophies, right? Have I ever done that? Yeah. 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 Um, so how can we tap into that? Um, I mean, I'm not sure about like, uh, like practical philosophical uh, political applications. I mean, it just seems to me like all kind of... Um, it's like when you love someone, like when you when you fall in love with someone, it's like you become one with them. You know, like the there's like people say that like uh, you know a man and woman become one flesh or whatever. It's like you become one with that person. But what that means is that you experience that person as yourself. It's like consciousness. Like it sounds like hippy dippy and stuff, but like consciousness is love because what love is 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 to share yourself with someone that so like you meet a, a woman or, or a man or whatever and they seem like another but then you caught and stuff and closer and closer and you collapse the difference you know and it's like the, there is no difference in the first place that difference where you say oh that's another person is like a kind of mental block that you're putting up where you're saying oh that's another and then when they come close you feel the lack of distinction but that lack of distinction that love is ever present because there's you never actually come into contact with the other you know what i mean so there is no enemy there is no other there's just yourself you know and so that consciousness is love you know because and i think that all all goodwill and all true ethics stems from that foundation because of, of love Okay, it's cool. I think that's a good that's a good thing to end on, right? That's a good uh, end note. Mm -hmm. Is uh, is is the love? Thank you very much, Harry, for talking about your essay and your your um your worldview. I guess would True. you call it? What would you call it? Yeah, for uh, consciousness only ontology. There we go. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, bye. Have a good one.